Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Cosley. I am a member of the People's Power Assembly. Let me start. Let me start by welcoming our guests, uh, um, our guests who are here to speak to us, and the guests who are here in the audience. Welcome. Uh, normally on Wednesdays, uh, at this time and in this space, we have a, um, a convening of the People's uh, Power Assemblies, where we review and. Um, the recent uh, period and plan for uh, involvement in future um, events. Uh, the PPA participates in many grassroots activities, principally uh, but not exclusively in the Black Lives Movement. We participate in the immigrant rights struggle and the anti-fascist movement against police violence and incarceration, as well as other issues. We were part of an amazing contingent at New York City Pride this year, the summer. Uh, Pride is under attack and we have to defend it. Uh, you can find us at May Day um, celebration every year as well, but you'd probably expect to find us there. Um, like all of you here, our ambition is to change the world, and there is no shortage of issues to address. Our meetings regularly include um, an educational component where a member or a guest gives a presentation on a topic uh, of interest followed by a discussion um, of that issue. As examples, uh, this past summer we had an amazing educational by Ori from International Concerned Friends of Mumia Abu Jamal. The presentation was on Mumia and on the MOVE organization and it was magnificent. We had a presentation on the struggle in South Africa over university fees or tuition as we say here. It was delivered by a South African activist a sc and scholar who we met at the Women's March here in New York City, small world. Um, if you are local or just in town on a Wednesday, you can, you're welcome to join us here at 7 as we meet to plan how to intervene in the struggle. This is not a PPA meeting tonight. As most, if not all of you know, there was an important and successful tribunal here um, in New York uh, this past weekend to put the United States on trial for its colonial crimes against Puerto Rico. <laughs> As such, uh, there are many friends in town um, from around the country, and a request was made of us to allow this meeting tonight. Um, um, as today works best for the folks visiting, uh, we are happy to accede to this request and look forward to the program. Uh, the, so the subject of this meeting is an important one because of the interconnectedness of things that sometimes seem far apart. I will now turn the mic over to um, Sade Swift, who will share this meeting and also introduce the speakers. Thank you. Welcome again. Thank you for that welcome. Um, and I want to thank the Solidarity Center for hosting us, um, BAP, Black Alliance for Peace, Black is Back Coalition, um, and United National Anti-War Coalition. Thank you for sponsoring us. Um, so why, why are we here? End the Wars at Home and Abroad is part of the anti-war autumn event series, which is aimed to raise issues around war, militarization, imperialism, and more of those things with people just like you. The continuous and never-ending wars abroad have con contributed to the militarization of the US borders, communities, and the entire country. Important reforms that have been, brought, that have been fought for by generations of activists are under attack by both major political parties. It is by understanding we have a common enemy that we can build a mass movement to fight back. A little bit about Black Alliance for Peace. Black Alliance for Peace is a people-centered human rights project against war, repression, and imperialism. The Black Alliance for Peace seeks to recapture and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-imperialist, and pro-peace positions of the radical black movement through educational activities, organizing and movement support, organizations and individuals in the alliance will work to oppose both militarized domestic state repression and the policies of destabilization, um, subversion and the permanent war agenda of the US state globally. This event is also a continuous, a continuation of the launch of shutdown uh, AFRICOM, uh, which is part of the campaign to close all U.S. foreign bases. So now to introduce our amazing speakers, 
um, who will give a 10 minute remark each, and then there will be a Q&A after. So first I'll start off with Joe Lombardo, who is the co-coordinator of, um, of UNAC, a coalition of anti-war and social justice organizations in the United States. He is a frequent commentator on several progressive TV and radio programs. Joel was a staff person for the National Peace Action Coalition, one of the two major anti-war coalitions in the US that organized against the Vietnam War. He is a longtime labor activist, a member of CSEA Local 999, and a delegate to the Troy Area Labor Council. Help me welcome Joe. Hello, everybody. It's, it's great to be here again tonight. Um, as was mentioned, I'm the co-coordinator of UNAC, United National Anti-War Coalition, which is a coalition of about 160 groups, um, peace, social justice organizations throughout the country, including the groups that are represented on the, on the panel here tonight. Uh, UNAC was started in 2010 at a conference of around 800 people up in Albany, New York. Strange place for a conference, um, but it's where I live, so it's, it was good that way for me. Um, one of the reasons we formed at that point is because the anti-war movement was kind of collapsing around us. It, it collapsed once we saw um, Barack Obama come into office. A lot of people thought the war was going to end with Obama, that now the Democrats were in and uh, things would change. But um, those of us who have been organizing for a while sometimes have characterized the uh, Democratic Party as the graveyard of movements, and it certainly was the graveyard of the anti-war movement as a movement that was strong in the beginning of the century, in the beginning of the period after Iraq um, in particular, um, dissolved and UNAC came on the scene to try to keep it going because we knew the wars were going and the wars in fact have um, expanded and, and extended. The title of that conference was End the Wars at Home and Abroad. Um, it wasn't a title that ha was used a lot back then. I mean, the idea was there, but it wasn't used. And now it's pretty much used by everybody in the anti-war movement. Uh, it's a very important achievement. We understood it in Albany, and part of the reason that our conference was in Albany is because the Muslim community in Albany was under attack, and this was part of the war on terror, which was the excuse for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and since. They don't use it so much anymore, that terminology, but that's what it was. What had happened in Albany um, was uh, the FBI went into various mosques, and one in particular, an inner city mosque, low-income people, um, and they um, sent an a FBI agent into the mosque who um, pretended to be a member of the mosque and tried to frame people up. Um, he tried to get someone to take a loan because his pizza business was going under, and he did certain things to, that made uh, it look like there was laundering of money going on with this loan and he had told other people that he wanted to use some of the money um, that was being laundered for some missile or something of that sort. It was a total setup, and two people were arrested. Uh, the Albany community and the peace community came behind them, and that's why it was important to, that we met in Albany. We came behind them in a strong way. Um, they were each uh, sentenced to 15 years in jail. Um, one of them, the imam of that particular mosque, got out last month after 13 years in jail. We've kept the movement going for that whole time. We meet at the mosque um, on a monthly basis. We've had demonstrations. Uh, we commemorate the days of their arrest and so forth. We've kept it going that whole time. But we expanded it. We helped build into a national organization that looked at the, at the attacks on Muslims throughout the whole country. Um, and there have been, by the government's own admission, hundreds, they say 600, we think it's more, hundreds of Muslims that were arrested in these 
sting operations, these preemptive uh, sting operations, where basically they did nothing, but they were framed, they were entrapped, they were bribed, they were something to get after these Muslims. And this helped stoke the idea of a war on terror so they can conduct these wars at home, uh, uh, abroad. And this was part of the war at home as we um, understood it. In Albany, the guy they sent into the um, mosque was someone that they had watched for a while. He was a Pakistani who was doing some illegal activity. He was selling illegal licenses to people. And when they had him on something like 98 cases of selling these licenses, they came to him and said, you're going to jail for a long time, then we're going to deport you back to Pakistan unless you help us out. So he agreed to stab his fellow Muslims in the back. He agreed to help them out. Um, and he went into these mosques, first the Albany Mosque, set people up so that they can bring cameras and say, you see, we have homegrown terrorists, and this is what we have to do. And that there's a direct line from that to Trump's Muslim ban and so many of the other things that we're seeing today. This man then went to Newburgh Mosque, did a similar thing. He tried to bribe some very poor Muslims and help me bomb this Jewish synagogue in Riverdale up, up north from here. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And he said, well, you know, we got to do this. Jews are bad, all this kind of stuff, over and over, um, until finally he said, I'll give you each $5,000. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. Eventually it got up to $250,000, and these four men spoke to themselves and said, okay, this guy's going to give us this money, let's tell him yes, but we won't do it. And he said, well, you have to go, and you have to set the bomb, and you have to do all this kind of stuff, um, and once it's done, uh, I'll give you the money. So they went down to Riverdale to this temple uh, with a bomb in the car, and they told him, he, he had told them what they had to do to arm, arm this bomb. It was a bomb the FBI gave them. And he, they decided they were going to make it look like they were doing it, but they never armed the bomb. But as soon as they walked away from the car where this bomb was, they were arrested. They're spending the rest of their lives in jail. There's an uh, HBO movie about that case. He then went out to Pittsburgh. He did a similar thing. And there's another movie called Terror, with T in brackets to show error, where it talks about how he set up some people in Pittsburgh and who knows how many other places. But they gave him a lot of money. And what he did with that money was he bought a limousine company, used cars that were not very roadworthy, that couldn't pass inspections. He used people that didn't have licenses to drive these cars. And you might have heard of the case that happened in Albany about a month or so ago where one of his cars was driving 20 people, um, it crashed it, it was, and killed them all. That is the war coming home. This person should have not been able to do that. It was FBI money to do it. The FBI is complicit in that. All of this stuff is racism. It's racism. Racism is behind every, every war. There's racism when they militarize the border and now they're sending people out there. The war is coming home by because of what U.S. policy has been, um, we have uh, refugees coming up through Mexico. People have come because of U.S. wars, refugees into into um, uh, uh, into Europe. It's happening. Every, that's the war coming home too. Wars don't stay overseas; they come home. The racism and militarization of the police programs, like Stop and Frisk, that's the war also coming home. This country has never dealt with racism. When I was at an anti-NATO protest recently, I spoke to some people in Germany. And they said, you know, in Germany, after World War II, it was mandatory that everybody have a course in their schools. It's mandatory in all their schools on Nazism and anti-Semitism so they could learn about what happened. They do not have roads and statues of the Nazi figures in their country. If you want to say it's part of our history, you put it in, in a museum. But we never dealt with racism or the legacy of slavery or white supremacy in this country, except for a very brief period after the Civil War, which was known as Radical Reconstruction, when some of the legislators in the South were taken over primarily by blacks. And some of the best legislation that this country has ever seen came from those legislators. Public schools, 
public okay. transportation, graduated tax systems, anti-discrimination laws. But when they saw that, they pushed back, they brought in the Klan, they, brought, they stopped the voting process down there, they instituted Jim Crow, um, and racism has never been dealt with. Today, if a black goes to a, a, a court in many of the southern states, he has to pass a statue of um, a Confederate person. Drive on a road named after a Confederate person that doesn't think they should have any human rights at all, in fact, don't even think they're human. That's what we have in this country, that racism. And that racism has been used in every war. How they dehumanize the people we go against, call them gooks or ragheads or whatever. And that racism is what we see that stokes the right-wing Trump movement today that is responsible for the things we've seen in the last week, for the bombings, for the um, uh, 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 killings that took place in Pittsburgh, and the killing that you don't hear about that took place outside of, of um, Kentucky, where a white man walked up and killed two blacks. He went out in a, in a, a parking lot, saw a white, and the white said, wait, you know, don't, don't shoot me. He said, oh, I don't shoot whites, I only shoot blacks. That's the endemic racism and white supremacy that exists. And then Trump gets up at one of his meetings and says, I'm a nationalist. At that meeting, it's understood what that means. That means white nationalist. That's exactly what it means. So the anti-war movement is opposed to the wars abroad and the wars at home, and they are connected. And when we make that connection and understand that connection and we support the struggles and they come together and we understand that our enemy is the same enemy and racism, imperialism are connected, when we understand that we will build an anti-war movement, we will build a left in the United States, we will build a movement that can confront the, the racism and white supremacy in the United States. And that's what we're, we are trying to do. So I urge you all to join us in that effort. Now, I just want to mention before I end, there's three things coming up as part of this anti-war autumn that you should know about. Not this weekend, but the following weekend in, in DC, Trump was going to have a military parade. Could you imagine that? It was canceled. But you know, when a country like North Korea holds a military parade, they are saying to the United States, don't attack us because we can fight back. When the United States does it, it says, don't oppose us or we will smash you. And, um, but we organized 260 groups or something like that signed a letter saying we are going to be there to oppose him. Nobody gave him support and he canceled it. But we will be there because we're not canceling the answer war movement. So if you'd like to join us that weekend in, in um, DC, see me and I'll give you the details. The following weekend, we are going to be in Dublin because we're going to have a, a, a conference against military bases. We're going to make connections with people from countries all around the world. Some of the people in this room will be there. Um, and there will be people from 35 countries right now who will be there. A group of about 50 of us are going from the United States. Cheap flights from New York. I urge you to join us. If you're interested in that, come and see me. But now Trump has announced that NATO's coming to DC in this spring, and they're gonna have a meeting on April 4th. April 4th was the day that Martin Luther King was killed. It's not a um, coincidence that he did it on that day, um, in my opinion. And, but it gives us an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to make a reality between the connection between the anti-war movement and the black liberation and civil rights movements and bring these two movements together to oppose NATO and to oppose racism in this country. And that's what we're going to do. We've already um, have uh, um, some permits and I, you'll hear more about it. I urge you all to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Maurice Carney, uh, who is one of the co-founders of Friends of Congo and currently serves as the organization's executive director. He has worked with Con Congolese for over 15 years in their struggle for peace, justice, and human dignity. Give him a hand. Good evening, good evening everyone. 
It's a, a pleasure and honor to, to be here um, uh, with you tonight to share, um, to some extent, uh, what's uh, unfolding on the African continent and uh, the role, the, the destructive role that the United States uh, has played um, throughout the, the continent that may not be readily evident uh, to even some of the keenest observers. And I would like to shed some light and provide a glimpse into the tremendous pain and suffering uh, that uh, African people have experienced as a result of a callous foreign policy <laughs> that um, one can argue seems to seek out revolutionaries, freedom fighters, and uh, not only destroy them, but fundamentally dismantle uh, any kind of foundation they've built to um, pursue independence on the African continent. Uh, some of us, um, about a year ago, came to um, understand or become, became aware of U.S. military presence on the African continent uh, because four of your soldiers uh, were killed in Niger, in West Africa. Um, however, that was just a, a tip of the the iceberg. We, uh, this year, October, is the 10th anniversary of AFRICOM. And those of you who have followed the Black Alliance for Peace, um, seen an accounting of what uh, U.S. militarization has wrought on the continent for the past decade or so. We, I'll touch upon that a, a little bit, where since 2008, when George Bush, Donald Rumsfeld established uh, the Africa Command uh, with an initial intent to establish bases on the continent, but was roundly rejected by almost all African leaders except for one, uh, so, uh, Liberians, Liberia's leaders, leader, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, was the one African leader that invited the U.S. said, come, you can establish a base here on the African continent. So, in spite of the wholesale rejection of the Africa Command, the moment President Obama got into office, even though he didn't create it, he accelerated it. And he was able to do it in uh, a fashion, I would argue, that President Bush couldn't have. Uh, black President of the United States, uh, people not uh, being too critical, uh, seen as a friend of Africa. So he was given far more latitude. And of all the things that Africa needs, at least, I could list 100 things that Africa needs, a continent. And military assistance and military presence, US military presence wouldn't top, come in that top 100. Nonetheless, since President Obama got in office, US military presence on the continent had accelerated uh, to a point of grown almost 2,000% have, uh, although there weren't um, bases other than what we find in Djibouti, the military footprint with special operations forces, with um, drones, uh, lily pads as they call them, uh, training, uh, you find it almost all of the African continent. Dozens of African countries serve as a space for U.S. Uh, presence. Now, U.S. would say that they're on the continent in an effort to fight terrorism. However, when the United States joined up with NATO in 2011 with uh, the French and Sarkozy and uh, undertook regime change in Libya, what that did was it accelerated terrorism, terrorists on the, on the continent. It increased the number of terrorists. It, what it did was weapons that were in Libya were now being found in the area that they call the Sahel. 
you know, in Niger and Chad and the surrounding countries to um, uh, Libya. And then the United States make the argument, well, we need to go after the terrorists, even to the point where French troops had to go into Mali at, uh, at one point to confront uh, the terrorists. So if anything, the US presence has been an accelerator of terrorism on the continent and not a deterrent. In fact, wherever they go, we see an increase in terrorism. Even though the rationale is not tenable that they're there to um, fight terrorists, US is on the African continent to protect its strategic interests. The Chinese are uh, expanding their presence on an economic front, and neither Europe nor the United States can compete with the Chinese economically. However, the great equalizer is the US military. So they're on the continent to protect their military interests and also secure access to strategic minerals and resources. Mineral resources that are vital to the functioning, not only of their technology industries and the electronics industries, but aerospace industries, but particularly military industry. Uh, the um, African um, scholar, Ali Missouri, who wrote a book called The Africans, he had uh, quipped at one point that if the Congo were to cease its uh, export of cobalt, the entire NATO flotilla would be grounded because cobalt was that vital to the military industry. Now, with the US military presence, with its hard power on the continent that is beyond, below the radar, there's another even more insidious presence that the US has on the African continent that has wrought a great deal of devastation. And this is the support of what um, some people call strong men or friendly tyrants. So instead of the United States, uh, this is before, even before AFRICOM, instead of the United States having its uh, a strong, broad military uh, or, or a troop presence, what it, what it does is it supports these strong men. And people such as Yari Museveni, for example, in Uganda. And what they do is they provide them with military training and provide them with arms, they provide them with intelligence. And then these leaders use the tools that they receive from the United States to invade other countries. They use the tools that they receive from the United States to suppress their own uh, population Therefore, therefore, clamping down in any kind of res resistance that we see on the African continent, trying to bring about uh, change in, whether it's in uh, Uganda, or Rwanda, the Congo itself. And probably the best example of the devastating role that the United States support of these uh, strong men or these proxy forces as um, route is in the case of the Congo. In 1996, uh, the Rwandan government, the Ugandan government, invaded the Congo with the backing of the United States. And as a result of that 96 invasion and the second invasion in 1998, an estimated six million Congolese lost their lives. And in, that inv in those invasions, the United States not only provided military aid and financing and intelligence and equipment and training. But when these invaders were brought to bed on, at the international level, the United States would run diplomatic and political interference so that they wouldn't be held, to, held accountable. So this kind of support that we see uh, being provided to these leaders, some of the most backward sociopathic uh, leaders that you can find on the African continent has been uh, really an obstacle for advancement on the continent uh, as a whole. If we look at uh, Uganda, for example, and, okay, we have uh, Uganda and, uh, we gotta wrap up, Uganda and Rwanda, for example. Rwanda's received about a billion dollars over the last decade or so in US military assistance. When Obama first came into office, uh, was first when he was inaugurated, 
in 2009, there was a huge shipment of military equipment to the Rwandan government that was subsequently used to destabilize uh, the Congo. Seeing that we have to bring it to a close, one of the key things that we can do, or several key things that we can do, one is to learn more about what's uh, unfolding on the continent and the role that the United States is playing in terms of arming uh, these strong men on the continent. Two, these strong men who are suppressing their population, the social justice movements that are found in these countries, we need to reach out to them in solidarity and support them by amplifying their stories, by uh, providing them with access to platforms so that they can share with you the struggles that they're waging and the role not only that their um, leaders are playing, but the role that the United States is playing to um, support those leaders who are suppressing the population. So in the question and answer, we'll get into more as to how we can be engaged in supporting social movements on the continent. Uh, but uh, just to, um, to conclude that uh, it's about time that we un pull away the veils, so to speak, of the role that the United States has been playing in supporting strongmen on the continent, in uh, preventing progress on the continent uh, because of its, uh, its foreign policy and its military policy. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Lisa Davis, who is a longtime community activist and who is the, chair, the vice chair of the Black is Back uh, Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, and is the chair of its healthcare working group. Please welcome Lisa. Good evening, everyone. Um, I always enjoy coming to the um, International Action Center um, because I'm among friends. And um, many of you I've had the chance to work with very, very closely. And I'm also glad to see that there are a lot of faces here that I don't really know, a lot of younger faces, because it is so important. It is so important to take what is going on personally, to take it literally, and to walk like the world depends on you individually. Walk with it on your shoulders. Carry it on your shoulders. We must do that. People, people are being murdered. People are dying. Generations are suffering and being destroyed. While people over here too many people over here get to go to sleep at night and not give a shit. And doing it with these dollars over here. So it must be personal. We must move like if we don't get up and do something that it will be our fault personally that things did not change. But of course we know we must move collectively, but we have to walk like that, we must. Um, I am with the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. And um, we were founded, um, I shouldn't just say in response to the election of Barack Hussein Obama, but that was certainly one of the, the motivations for it. But definitely there were so many other things that were going on and people felt that it was time that we really stood up and the name Black is Back was chosen specifically to honor and to own the tradition of the black liberation struggle in this country, which has been one of the most righteous struggles you know, has a history unparalleled, you know, to many of the other struggles. And definitely, whenever we, we talk about liberation, whenever we talk about what is right, whenever we talk about any of those things in this country, whenever we talk about any so-called right that anybody has, you cannot not talk about the African liberation struggle. And um, so we chose or the name was chosen, the Black is Back Coalition, to honor that, but also to, 
to basically give notice that we were not going to mint what was going on. We were not going to, for lack of a better word, sort of do a kumbaya stuff because too much was happening. We wanted to rip the, the veil off, so to speak. We wanted to say no more. We must talk about what is going on here. We must develop the political maturity to talk about it and um, have to do it. Can't be so worried about political correctness or niceness when the wars that are happening, not just abroad, but right here on on these grounds, on this soil, these wars that continued, that never stopped, that never stopped. This country has never, ever been forced to, this government has never, ever been forced to examine itself thoroughly. And it requires, well, it doesn't require, I should say, but it should happen that white America or white people all over the world, really, because it wasn't just an American thing that happened, but that they look at themselves. And there's not going to be any way around that. There's not going to be any way around that at all. Peace does not just mean the absence of dropping bombs or, or murdering people. That is not peace, although we do want that to happen. But it has to be much more than that. Because you can have a lot of wars. There are so many wars, and you don't necessarily even have to fire a shot. But you do it through your policies, through your economics, through creating uh, systems that are absolutely untenable, that rob people of their essence, their lives, their everything. And that is what the current system that we are faced with right now, the system of white, racist, colonialist power. And we must deal with that openly up front, and we must root it out. We must destroy it. But we must also examine what we are talking about. We are not talking, when we talk about getting rid of that, we're not talking about putting a black face or a Latino face or anything like that on a corrupt, thoroughly despicable system. We are not talking about that. We must definitely move to a systems analysis. That is very, very important. A system analysis in which we examine every aspect of what was you know, given to us. And many of us, unfortunately, at least I also speak for myself on this, when we talk about that, when we talk about, well, we have to bring capitalism down, how many of us really have an idea in our head in terms of what it would look like without this system of capitalism, what it would be replaced with? But these are the things that we must fight. These are the things that we must absolutely make clear that we are talking about. We must repeat it over and over and over again. Revolution, socialism, revolution, socialism, destruction, destruction of a blood thirsty, horrific system called capitalism in which this country was based upon, in which Europe founded its riches upon, they founded their riches upon the destruction and mutilation of people and primarily people of color. We cannot walk away from that. We cannot at all walk away from that. So um, the, this is the situation that we find ourselves in today. And we find that this country seeks to do in the area that is called the Middle East. I'll just use that word for right now. But I heard somebody one time just put it so truthfully. They seek to do over there what they did to the indigenous people here and to African people. They seek to do that over there. And we must stand up. We must fight strongly. We must stop it. We must fight with everything. We must fight in deed and in word and thought process. We must absolutely do that. And we must bring it home. We must bring it home. 
what is going on to everybody who walks around in this country. We must make it personal to them. It's almost like um, if they don't show a dead body bl being blown up, doesn't mean a war is not going on. 17 years of overt war, and today it's not even an issue with the elections coming up. It's not even anything anybody is really demanding in terms of people's position on the war. The Republicans and the Democrats both equally, equally pro-war. And in fact, people can say all this stuff about Trump and everything that I've heard them say about him is true. I take nothing away from that, but you know, I can talk about them, them both, the Republicans and the Democrats, and speak the truth about them. But when he does something with war, when he bombs somebody, when he bombs a country, or when he asks for the largest increase ever in the military budget, there is not a sound coming from the Democrats. There is nobody talking about, not the media or anything like that, although this man is, you know, considered a, a deranged maniac, and I will not, I'm not speaking against that. I think it's true. But they say nothing. They say nothing about that at all. So I'm just going to talk about a few things. I see the one minute sign. It goes so fast. <laughs> it really goes so fast when you're up here. But one of the things I'm going to just, uh, bring out just some ideas in terms of, okay, what can we actually do? Because I know I'm here preaching to the choir. But here are some of the things that we must begin to do. We must begin to demand how many people, how many people have been killed in these current wars? The people that are being attacked are a nothingness. They don't count for anything. They have been reduced to nothingness by this country. Maybe they might be referenced as collateral damage. That's not good enough. We in the war, we in the anti-war movement should be demanding every single day. We want to hear from this government. We want answers. We don't just want the number of you know, Americans who were killed. We want the numbers, period. How many people have you been killing, they matter, they count, and you will no longer dismiss that at all. We should begin to re-examine or maybe talk about, talk about the utter hypocrisy of uh, people who seem like they are just so pro-war, they don't care, they don't care because it's not their families going over there. And I remembered when the war first happened and I saw something in the Black Agenda report and I can't remember exactly who was um, calling for it, so I won't try to quote any names, but it seemed like somebody was saying there should be a draft, and I remember thinking, oh no, we can't have that, no way, no way at all. And um, I believe, I know that the rhetoric was that if you make it personal to people, which a draft will make it personal, they're not gonna sit up, this, these wars will not go on so long. And basically, that's the gist of what they were saying. And I remember at that time thinking, oh, no way, we can't have a draft come on. Because I just assumed that people would be so outraged about the war and that there would be such a growing demand to end these wars. But I was wrong. And now there's silence. Now there's just nothing because people over here get to eat their breakfast and go to sleep at night, and they just don't give a shit about it. Many of them, you know, will just uh, swallow the thing about American exceptionalism, which is as racist as any other term that you could possibly use. But I think we got to begin to raise that issue. I think we have to begin to say, if you're going to be so pro-war, how dare you think that you can sit up there and not have to worry about while they're dropping bombs on other people overseas. How dare you think that you don't have to pay for some of that you know, you believe in it so much, then make your families go. And I think we have to reconsider the issue of the draft because this is just unfair. It's insufferable. What's it going to take to stop it? And I know that's not a very popular position, but we have to really, I think we need to talk about that in those terms. Because if you had a draft and you thought your children were going to be going over there, you'd be talking about ending it. And how dare you think that you don't have to put anything towards something like this. How dare you think that it's all right for other people to die for something evidently you believe in. So, um, oh, so 
you know, I want to uh, just close with uh, one of the, a couple of events that are happening this uh, Saturday and Sunday, November 4th, November 3rd and 4th. The Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations will be in D.C., and we will be having our annual march on the White House. Um, our, our position is that there is no peace. Africa and Africans are at war. U.S. to the world, comply or die. We will be meeting in Malcolm X Park at uh, 12 o'clock on November 3rd, and uh, we, will be we'll, we will have a rally in the park, and then we will be marching to the White House, and we ask that you join us. I realize that there's a lot going on, but these are the times. We should be in Washington, D.C. every weekend marching on the White House. It's that important. And then on Sunday, we're going to have a conference at 12 noon at the Stewart Center. But really, we could certainly, we want to see faces there, not just black faces at that march, but everybody. And so again, um, we ask you to help, uh, to push it, to promote it, and come. I mean, the bus, mega bus, goes right to D.C. You got buses going all day long, you know, in New York City. So it's important that people be there. And also, um, on Tuesday, November 7th, the chair of the Black is Back Coalition and also the chair of the African People's Socialist Party will be speaking um, in New York City. He's going to be speaking uh, at se from 7 o'clock to 9 p.m. They're having something at the Vision Space um, in New York City, 566 7th Avenue, Suite 504. I have some information about this. Uh, the people who are sponsoring this are called the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, and they are... Their movement is about white solidarity with black power. And they are calling for reparations. So I think it would be a very, very, very insightful and informative um, program for you to attend. It's going to be in New York City on uh, November 7th. And Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tuesday the sixth. Thank you, Dave. David is a member of the uh, Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Thank you so much. From Boston, so I thank you. So yeah, uh, Tuesday, November 6th. So I invite everybody to be there. And just uh, in wrapping it up, when I hear people talking about uh, Barack Hussein Obama and AFRICOM, my position is that that's exactly why he was chosen to be president for AFRICOM. It was no accident. Thank you so very much, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Brid Bernadette Aloran, um, who is a national spokesperson of the U.S. chapter of Bayan, or Bayan USA, an alliance of 23 Filipino organizations across the U.S. Wow. representing workers, immigrants, youth, students, women, cultural workers, artists, and LGBTQ folks. Bayan is the main political center for the anti-imperialist mass movement in the Philippines and at the forefront of the struggle for national democracy with a socialist perspective. From 2009 to 2018, Aloran served as the chairperson of Bayan USA. Aloran is also a member of the International Coordinating Committee of the International League of People's Struggle, a global anti-imperialist and democratic formation of 300 members present in over 40 countries representing national and social liberation movements against imperialism and reaction. So welcome her. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to see my sisters in struggle, uh, Juyun from Korea and Hideko from Okinawa, are my Asian sisters in struggle. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the Asia Pacific region is a region we have to continuously pay attention to uh, because it is, for the, since the 20th century, the, um, it is, remains the uh, site of the largest um, global command of the U.S. Armed Forces, which is the Pacific Command, where you have the largest concentration of military bases and installations and presence in the world. Um, so that being said, um, the Philippines is um, the largest recipient of U.S. military aid in the Asia Pacific region. And when I say aid, I am referring to any funding, weaponry, technology that's used for Philippine military, uh, Philippine National Police, and U.S. military operations in the country. Um, just to give uh, some historical background, the Philippines was once a direct colony of the U.S. How many people here knew that? So, um, and now the Philippines is a neo-colony of the U.S. How many people here know that? Okay. 
So um, one, uh, one, um, one agreement under the U.S. Pacific Command in the Philippines is the Mutual Defense Treaty. And there are MDTs for, with other countries as well. But the MDT in the Philippines was established in 1951 as a framework status of forces agreement under which there are many derivative agreements that basically allow for a permanent rotational presence of U.S. military in the country. So we may not have our permanent bases anymore, but because of these all other derivative um, agreements, the US military can basically operate permanent, permanently, but with a rotational presence in over 20 ports all over the country they have free access to. They also um, are, are annually there for uh, counterterrorism exercises with the Philippine military. They're also supplying, um, just, just this year alone, uh, the US government has supplied um, many, much weaponry and technology to the Philippines, um, including um, the Raven and the Scan Eagle uh, drones, which they do conduct drone warfare, both for killing and also sur for surveillance. Um, they also su uh, supply the Glock pistols, the M4 carbines, the grenade launchers, the operation gear, and the mini guns on, all the, on the helicopters in the Philippines. The U.S. also supplies um, ships and rubber boats in the Philippines for the Philippine Marines and, um, and the Navy. They also supply um, um, aircrafts for the Philippine Air Force. So this is just, I'm not going to really focus on, um, on this. I will focus on the why. Um, the why, is, why is the Philippines so militarized um, and, and militarized both by U.S. and also U.S. military aid? It's because it's the fifth most mineral rich country in the world. Um, it has over one trillion in untapped mineral, agricultural, and marine wealth. Um, it's the regional food basket. So it supplies food, it feeds a lot of the region. It's also, because of this, it's, it's strategic for US geopolitics as it is situated right, right at the South China Sea. And it also has the longest running armed uh, revolution in the region, including, including Islamist uh, armed groups, separatist groups in the region. But I want to call our attention more to um, why there is a long-standing armed revolution in the Philippines. And that's because the Philippines is rich, but the people are poor. And this is, the, this is the story of many, many poor countries around the world. They're rich, but the people are poor. Um, just, just 11 days ago, um, in the sugar, in the Visayas, which is the central region of, of the Philippines, there was a massacre of nine peasants, nine sugar farmers that were affiliated with the union, uh, by an affiliated union. Um, and under Duterte, we know about this drug war, we know about the, the killings of, of drug, of drug so-called drug addicts in the urban centers. We don't really hear about um, the killings of farmers in the countryside. And under, under Duterte, there have been at least 13 massacres of farmers. Um, and the, the militarization and the abuses in the countryside are very rarely, very rarely make the news in comparison to the drug war. Uh, so these are also state-sanctioned killings under the Duterte regime. Um, the, the, what you have to understand is that, um, that these killings are perpetrated by the Philippine military who are funded by U.S. military aid. And, um, and in many poor countries, like the Philippines, um, there is a hacienda system. So the Philippines was once a colony of Spain, and Spain established a hacienda system or a cash crop system that the U.S. colonial government um, developed and maintained because it was a useful tool to keep the country um, subjugated. Um, the 75% of the Philippine population are from the rural communities and live off the land, but all of them don't own the land that they till. They're, they, are, um, they are beholden to a very small uh, clique of landlord families that basically own all of the Philippines and work in collusion with uh, big foreign national corporations. Um, the, the, the Philippines is the ninth largest sugar producer in the world, and these farmers were killed in the, in the sugar producing capital of uh, the area of the Philippines. When we think about um, the armed revolution in the Philippines, we think about armed struggle, but really the people's war in the Philippines, the main content of the people's war in the Philippines is not armed struggle. The main content of the people's war is agrarian revolution. And when we say agrarian revolution, we're, we're talking about a broad spectrum of, of activities. 
Um, it could it could at the minimum it's the struggle or a campaign for uh, lowering the tax or the tax on agricultural goods as well as lowering the rent on on land and and as far as um, actual land confiscation and occupation you know by, by military f if by armed force if needed but you know we don't think about those things we think about the armed struggle which is important but the but the peasantry the farmers the indigenous people are also struggling to protect and and defend their lands and and for that they have to pay a very big price you know um, and this is the story of many many countries who have a hacienda system in, especially in Latin America, Latin and Central America, um, where the hacienda system literally keeps the country in a neo-colonial state. Um, so this is the this is at the center this is at the center of the hunger question in the Philippines. This is the center of the hunger question in the whole world, the land question. And if you don't understand the land question in the Philippines, you will never understand the anti-imperialist struggle in the Philippines. You have to understand the land question first. Um, and why there is an armed revolution in the country is because of the land question. And the people are raising arms to protect their land, to take their land back, and they're being killed for it. Um, and this is another face of US-led war and militarism that we need to also understand as anti-war and peace activists here in the US. So um, these farmers were killed while they were resting. Uh, they were recultivating their idle land um, that was promised to them years ago during the Cory Aquino administration. This is back in the 80s. But because it was never implemented, there have been a series of fake uh, agrarian reform bills that have passed, never genuine. They decided to take matters into their own hands and occupy the land themselves and recultivated it. Um, you know, they even, it's funny because they're, because they're a buy in affiliated sugar farm workers union. For many years, they were accused of being NPA, New People's Army, um, by the government and by the military. But when these farmers were killed, it was the military that accused the NPA of being the ones to do it. So um, you see how this works, you know, in the Philippines. That um, you know, we heard a story from a farmer who lost his son, and his wife was saying, um, you know, they, they accused us of being NPA. And now they say the NPA is the one who did this to us. We want, we want to speak to the NPA because we want, we want to find the NPA now because we want to seek revolutionary, ju revolutionary justice. When you hear things like that, you know, you can't help but be agitated and to cry because um, you see who the, those who are being killed, those who are being oppressed in the countryside, who they are seeking for revolutionary justice and for support because they know who are the ones that are helping them, they know who are the ones that are killing them. Um, so, um, all of this to say that we also need to support, as, as the, the struggle to cut U.S. military aid to the Philippines, the ongoing struggle to oust this current rotten dictator, um, Duterte, in, in the country, you know, like, you, solidarity from the U.S. played a pivotal role in the ouster of two presidents in 1986 and in 2000, and it can happen again. We're hoping it can happen again next year. Um, but the struggle to cut the aid is big. The struggle to get the U.S. military out of the Philippines is big. Um, but we also need your solidarity for our national liberation struggle. Uh, for, our, for those of us in the front lines, the freedom fighters in the Philippines, in the cities and in the countryside, who are really at the front lines or are shedding blood you know, to protect the Philippines from imperialist aggression, and also who are paying the highest price for, for the revolutionary struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you. You didn't even make it to the one minute sign. Oh, yeah. That's great. Um, last but certainly not least, um, we have Ajamu Baraka, who is a longtime activist, geopolitical analyst, writer, and human rights defender. He is an editor and contributor, columnist for the Black Agenda Report, co um, contributes to Counterpunch, Dissident, voice and a host of alternative news and in information outlets. Ajamu is currently the national organizer for the Black Alliance for Peace and a member of the coordinating committee of the Black is Back Coalition and the administrative committee of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Let's welcome Ajamu. Thank you, Shade. And thank all of you for coming out on this, um, this evening uh, where you could be someplace in mask and 
and all kinds of things and running the streets and doing the stuff you do on Halloween, but you are here instead to talk about something very, very important for all of us. This issue of war and peace and imperialism. So this is the place to be because we have to talk about what our responsibilities are, not only to the people in this country, but to the world. We have to talk about that because we have a primary responsibility to the people of the world. We are at the heart of empire, and we have heard tonight some of the consequences of empire. So we have to talk to people in this country about what is the only force that can put a break on the activity, the behavior of empire that is responsible for the death and destruction of people globally. And that is the people here. So these kinds of conversations are absolutely necessary. We have a sense of what we have to do, but we have to make sure that we understand what our responsibility is at this current moment to engage the people of this country to do what the two major parties are not doing, and that is to put front and center this issue of war and peace and the role of U.S. imperialism. Now, you know, we, we talk about uh, peace, and peace is important. We all want to have peace. Any person who is, is a rational and moral human being would like to live in a society, live in a world in which we have peace and where people can develop and live in peace. But we recognize that there could be no peace without justice. That's why we recognize and we say quite clearly that we understand that we are at war, that war is being waged against the people of this planet, that war is being waged against the working class and poor here in this country. And we say that Without struggle, there could be no peace. That basically, if we want peace, we have to fight for it. In order to fight for it, what do we have to do? We have to build more effective, powerful organizations. So that's why we're here tonight, to talk about what we have to do, what must be done. Brother um, Maurice talked about um, AFRICOM. We mentioned the fact that we have a new formation, the Black Alliance for Peace. We formed this particular organization, this alliance, uh, so that we can, in, in fact, address the current challenge of the moment. We recognize that one of the most uh, consistently anti imperialist, anti-war community in this country for decades was and is the black community. But we saw that under the influence of Barack Hussein Obama as the first black president, that there was a very um, dramatic uh, move to the right among the black community. That that traditional opposition to war and imperialism has slipped. And we saw that for eight years, there was that movement toward the right. Joe talked about the fact that the anti-war movement just about fell apart. That was a consequence of that, 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 that influence. So what we saw when Barack Obama uh, moved on, we saw a opportunity an opportunity to rebuild that traditional opposition, an opportunity to organize uh, the black community, 
to help to revive that traditional uh, black internationalism, to uh, recenter uh, black uh, opposition to imperialism as part of our effort not only to organize ourselves, but to revive and to reorganize uh, the broader anti-war movement. So we moved in April of 2017 to in fact do that. And we launched the Black Alliance for Peace. One of the major programs that we have just uh, embarked on uh, on October the 1st uh, was a campaign to raise uh, the awareness of the existence of AFRICOM, the US Africa Command, uh, to oppose that uh, command. This um, campaign is part of a larger campaign that we helped to put in place uh, back in January. Many of you are part of that process uh, where we came together in January in Baltimore uh, and we launched the coalition uh, to close all U.S. foreign bases. Uh, AFRICOM is the sort of subsection of that campaign. We are focused on closing all U.S. Uh, foreign bases, but we are taking a, a particular focus on AFRICOM. So we are part of this process of attempting to revive a powerful anti-war movement here in this country. We see the black community uh, and the Black Alliance for Peace as being a fundamental part of that process. And we see that folks who are uh, traditionally part of the left here in this country have to be part of that process. For us, we say that this issue of peace uh, and anti-imperialism has to be the central issue at this moment because we recognize that the U.S. state, because of the legitimation crisis it's facing, is now more dependent than ever before on the use of, of force, war, and imperialism. Therefore, we know that the repression is going to intensify domestically, and we can see that uh, the U.S. state has committed itself to more aggressive military action globally. So this issue of, of war uh, is front and center. But we have to connect up the issue of, of war and our commitment to peace with an understanding of the material basis for this war agenda. And that is imperialism. So we have to connect up the moral opposition crystallized in a, a, a pro-peace position with a material analysis reflected in uh, an anti-imperialist position. So those two have to be connected. And we have to articulate that as we engage the US public. We have to make sure that people understand that connection. Then we have to connect that to domestic repression. The imperialism that we have to struggle against globally is only the flip side of the domestic repression that we know the U.S. state is unleashing domestically. So those connections have to be made. They have to be made analytically and conceptually, and then confronted and dealt with politically. So these are, this is the task that we have at this particular historical moment to build a powerful resistance, to build our forces, to make sure that people understand that this issue of war is a class issue, but is also a race issue, and is a issue of gender. So building this movement, focusing our forces on building an, a powerful anti-war and anti-imperialist position is the central strategic objective, in our opinion, that we can take on today. So my friends, we have a lot to talk about in terms of how we in fact do that, because we're up against a, a, a formidable enemy that has been quite uh, effective in confusing people and diverting other people's attention. So I hope that in our conversation we can talk about how we address that, uh, we can talk about uh, and identify the kinds of, uh, of challenges we have that can undermine our ability to build this uh, anti-imperialist movement. 
uh, and that we can leave here tonight with more clarity and a more firm uh, commitment to build the kind of movement we have to build in order for us to live up to our historic responsibility to the people of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause for all the speakers. Y'all are amazing. Um, and now we're gonna take questions from the audience. Um, so please keep your remarks to one minute and then you can address it to one of the speakers. So uh, it was brought out that the uh, two of the things that were done in response by the ruling class to the anti-war movement in Vietnam was to eliminate the draft and of course was brought up the election of Barack Obama. But the other aspect, of course, is uh, once the fall of the Soviet Union took place, the, um, the neocons, who are very much influential in, in policy, have talked about the fact that they need to uh, create a new Pearl Harbor. And of course, that new Pearl Harbor to generate uh, broader uh, US intervention abroad was the events in 9-11, the demolition of the Twin Towers, as, as well as building number seven. So I know the anti-war movement generally doesn't touched upon this issue, but I think it's, it's crucial that we, uh, that we talk about that as part of the anti-war movement because it's the basis of the, uh, the war on terror. To justify the war on terror was the 9-11 events. So the 9-11 events, of course, was an, an action that uh, was, a, was a demolition. It was done by, we believe, um, a Mossad Israeli neocon operation, especially with the Twin, twin Towers. There was a, a demolition job based on the nature of the, of the Oh yeah, absolutely. So, 10 minutes, okay. So um, given that, time is up. Given that, I guess the panel has to address that, whether or not that should be part of the anti-war movement dealing with the issue of 9-11 and, the, and the, basically the false flag as well as the war on terror. That's basically it for now. It's part of the anti-war movement. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna take a few more and then folks are gonna answer. So if you can just walk up to the mic. Yep. And you can come up to the mic as well. We need the, yeah. Yeah, so if you can form a line, that would be great. Uh, thank you to all of the great panelists. I have a quick question, if any of you have any insights on what's going on with US policy towards Yemen over the last little more than a week, we've seen a real shift towards them talking about winding down the war, imposing new conditions on the Saudis. I don't think that any of this happened because the Saudis killed Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, but it almost seems like there were elements waiting for an opportunity to shift like this. And I wonder what ideas you might have about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, my, my question is, uh, <clears throat> is pretty uh, simple. Uh, when you come to these conferences, you rarely, if ever, hear about the, uh, the decline and the implosion of imperialism as it impacts on regions and countries uh, across the globe, uh, despite their um, uh, military supreme military presence, as uh, Mr. Carney pointed out, to maintain control over those, uh, over those resources, even in the face of these emergent alliance uh, that you see in China and Russia. But uh, we, we, can, can someone sort of address what it is, what analysis we can come up with in terms of the implosion that we are seeing both domestically and internationally, and what does that portend for the development of movements? I mean, we always hear about the slashing of the whip against uh, countries and people, but what is a deeper analysis about uh, this implosion 
that is uh, taking place, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in Africa or whatever. And what does that mean uh, in terms of the peace movement and how do you address that within the context of U.S. and the decline of U.S. imperialism? Thank, Thank you. you. How many questions do you all want to take? Okay. We'll take one more and then we'll have folks answer. Yes. Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Marty Goodman with Socialist Action. Uh, I want to applaud this uh, meeting tonight, particularly the formation of the Black Anti-War Committee. Um, there should be no trust in the Democratic Party and uh, whatever color you are, if you're a Democrat, you're an imperialist, I, I wouldn't care if you were Fidel Castro or Malcolm X running on the Democratic Party. I wouldn't vote for you because that is a party of war, racism, and imperialism. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Carney, is it? Yes. Uh, I, I've had some relation with uh, the struggle in South Africa in recent years. and. Um, I, I, I'm sure you're aware the uh, neoliberal uh, policies of the uh, South African government, Mr. Ramaphosa, who's a billionaire involved uh, deeply in the Marikana massacre of striking mine workers. Um, I wonder what it is, you, what is your assessment of the ANC now, uh, the African National Congress, and its relationship to uh, to uh, Africa, and I wonder if you would uh, let us know what you think of uh, the uh, the metal workers union NUMSA and the insurgent uh, 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 political energy that they they have produced, and they say they're going to form a revolutionary socialist party. Uh, I'm all one for that. Thank you. So that's going to be the last question for this round, and then. Do you want to begin? The last question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marty, for the. Uh, for the question regarding uh, um, South Africa and um, Ramaphosa. Um, you rightly um, pegged uh, uh, Ramaphosa, and in a, Sir Ramaphosa, who's the current um, president of, uh, of South Africa and head of the uh, African National Congress, who took over from uh, Jacob uh, Zuma. And uh, you rightly pegged uh, Ramaphosa in, in a lot of respects, uh, Ramaphosa is uh, emblematic of the ANC itself in that um, during the anti-apartheid movement, he was a foremost uh, labor um, leader. Uh, he uh, was at the, uh, the forefront of the resistance against uh, apartheid. And like many of uh, the uh, black uh, elites of the ANC, uh, he's been captured by finance capital. And he has uh, represented, um, uh, even though he has advanced um, in terms of his wealth um, in, uh, in South Africa, we see that uh, he's been in alignment um, with um, the old um, money and capitalists in, in South Africa with um, De Beers and Anglo Gold. And not only have they, he been in alignment with those um, capitalists in South Africa, um, but also uh, his footprint on the African continent has um, expanded. Um, uh, probably most uh, notoriously is his collaboration with um, a South African billionaire Ivan Glassenberg, who is heads up um, Glencore, which is one of the major mining companies in the world. And um, some of you in here may be familiar with Glencore. Uh, it's a company that was uh, founded by Mark Rich. And uh, as you know, Mark Rich was the um, fugitive that Bill Clinton 
um, uh, gave um, a pardon at the end of his uh, uh, administration. Um, so uh, Ramaphosa is firmly ensconced in that um, uh, network of uh, that elite of global capitalists that are not only plundering South Africa, but also uh, plundering uh, Congo and other countries on the, on the African continent. Uh, and now of late, um, the, he has um, called for, uh, or pushed, both he and the African National Congress have pushed uh, for one of the um, principles of the, the Freedom Charter, uh, which was to the ownership uh, of the land. And um, believe in part that uh, they're pushing in that, uh, in that direction uh, in order to um, curb the, the influence of uh, new formations such as the Economic Freedom Fighters who has, was running on ownership of the land and nationalizing of the mines and has proven to be quite successful, a uh, young party, uh, has quickly become the third largest party in South Africa. Um, they uh, dealt um, the African National Congress a uh, defeat in the August 2016 uh, local elections. So in part, the ANC is responding um, to that and trying to take that issue away from the economic freedom fighters in advance of the 2019 elections. I just quickly, or the National Union of uh, uh, Mine Workers of, uh, of South Africa, NUMSA, uh, is, oh, I'm sorry, Metal Workers of South Africa, they broke off um, from COSATU um, and uh, established their own path, as you know, their Marxist-Leninist um, platform. And uh, eventually, they announced that they will be establishing a party, um, party themselves. Um, they've, um, uh, they've, they, they, they've uh, not only um, um, looking to make strides in South Africa itself, um, but uh, they're also expanding on the African continent as a whole. Uh, they're a key um, uh, element in uh, three Pan-African conferences that have been organized um, throughout the continent in, in the last three years in Tunisia, in Zambia, and in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana. Um, so uh, they are um, uh, certainly going to be a force um, to, to reckon with, not only in South Africa or in the Southern African development community, but also on the, on the African continent, uh, African continent as, as well. Um, so uh, those are some of the um, um, comments that I have regarding, uh, I'm sorry. Um, there, there's some um, training. Uh, in fact, whew, uh, there's hardly a country on the continent that's not involved in one fashion or another with the U.S. Um, military. Um, whether it's, uh, it's in regard to training, uh, whether it's in regard to um, uh, military uh, equipment, uh, whether it's in regard to um, intelligence, um, the financing, it's, it's, you'd be hard pressed to, to find a, a country on the continent that's, that hasn't been touched by AFRICOM in, in one fashion um, or, or the other. Um, in fact, just to give you an example, the uh, Angolan elections that were held um, last year um, uh, when won by um, uh, Lorenzo, um, before the elections, um, he was right. He was here in the U.S. meeting with a with the Pentagon, right? And these are the same Angolans that uh, the Cubans uh, sent uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers to to support in their uh, fight against uh, the South Africans and the Central Intelligence Agency. So, uh, not only are many of these leaders, um, you know, whether it's Lorenzo or Ramaphosa, uh, firmly ensconced in the U.S. orbit in terms of military support but also as it relates to neoliberal policies, right? Uh, just the, the recent uh, World Economic Forum, you found there Paul Kagame of Rwanda, uh, you found uh, Ramaphosa was there, Lorenzo. So it's almost uh, as if that, that, uh, that element of, uh, of resistance, uh, anti-capitalist uh, resistance uh, at the level of the heads of state is virtually non-existent on, on the African continent. It's from below, uh, from the labor unions like NUMSA, from startup groups uh, like the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, from social uh, activist groups 
uh, throughout the continent that you're for a bottom-up movement where you're going to find that kind of anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist uh, resistance. And that's for the reason why I say one of the key things, oh, sorry, one of the key things is for us to support those groups that are involved in that battle because not only are they fighting against imperialism, they're also fighting against the agents of uh, neocolonialism like Ramaphosa, Lorenzo, and some of the other leaders on the continent. Sorry for taking so long. I'll just comment briefly on a couple of things you said. Um, uh, with the idea of 9-11 and a false flag, I mean, the major thing, you know, and my background is engineering, but I don't want to deal with the technical stuff of how that towers fell and who did it and all that kind of stuff. I want to deal with the politics, which is imperialism, and try to build a movement on that basis because that's, that's the political basis that we need to build the anti-war movement on. Um, on Yemen, I think it's a very interesting thing. The United States is now saying that maybe we need to have peace in Yemen. Uh, Saudi Arabia thought they were going to defeat Yemen immediately, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because we, we've all heard this lie about the Houthis and all. It's the people of Yemen. It's not a civil war that's going on there. It's the United States and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that are conducting a war against Yemen, and those people are not going to give up their country. It's like any war. The Palestinians have nothing compared to what Israel has in terms of weaponry and stuff, but they can't be defeated because they, will f they have to fight back. You have no, uh, nothing else you can do when you're being oppressed but move forward. They've been pushed to the wall and pushed to the wall, and they can't go back any further, so they go forward, and they're being shot down every Friday, and yet they still move forward. And we all need to give our solidarity to that, but that's, that's the reality of, of the situation. And on Nellie's question, which I think is really important, and really what I think it is, is a question which I think we need to discuss within the anti-war movement, which is the question is, what is the difference between the Vietnam anti-war movement and the anti-war movement today? And there's big differences, and it's usually minimized to, well, there's no draft. Well, it's true there's no draft, and they've learned stuff from that, not to have a draft and to use these proxy fighters like Saudi Arabia and others. Um, but the imperialism and capitalism are uh, in very dire straits. And they are struggling for diminishing resources around the world and competing with other, others to get those. Um, and th they cannot um, end these wars that they're in, these continuous wars, in the same way they were able to end the Vietnam War and move forward. That means a couple of things for the anti-war movement. It means that it's more difficult for us to build a, a movement. We're not going to see some quick victories. But it also means that everything we do in the anti-war movement is a direct blow against capitalism and imperialism. And it's essential to building the kind of left that we, we want. Um, when capitalism goes into a bad state, we just look at, at Germany after when it was defeated in World War I, it was in a terrible state. And if the, the left could not um, lead the population, it could very easily go to the right. And we're seeing that in many places around the world. We need to build a left. And to build the anti-war movement and an understanding of people that are fighting on the ground against things in their communities like cop killings and so forth, that there's an international piece to that. And that's the anti-war movement. That's the thing that we can help bring to building the left. And it's an essential piece. And that's what we have to do. And we need to build this left, otherwise it's going to move to the right. It's, it's a job that we all have to do every day. Anyone on this side? No, I think the red one. Yeah. So appreciative of uh, the questions. I just wanted to uh, just give a couple of comments and thoughts. Um, the issue with 9-11, um, I do think that that is um, an important issue to also talk about because as we know, so many things began to happen more overtly, you know, since that happened. You literally have a generation who have grown up knowing nothing but that. I mean, you walk down the streets now, it's not uncommon at all to literally see the military in Penn Station, New York, at the World Trade Center, you know, all just like it's nothing. So I think that... Um, that that is, you know, important that we should also talk about, but maybe not in the sense of, uh, like, I'm sorry, the 
my comrade Joe. named you know, over here was saying in terms of the technical things about what happened with it. But it's so important to use that to show how they got so many people, so many Americans to just lose sight of everything and how they normalize, normalize this open police state where we don't even see it happening, and how that was used as a way to just go on and, and expand these wars without end and to bomb and attack other countries that had nothing to do at all with the World Trade Center. No country attacked us. But, you know, the U.S. used that to, uh, you know, expand and do all the kind of things that they want. And I just think it's important uh, with some of the other issues that have been raised. It just goes to show the importance of building uh, the anti-war movement over here and to let our comrades overseas, to let our comrades internationally know that we are with them and that we thoroughly condemn the United States' roles in any of this and what they're doing. I think that's so important to do. On the question of um, the war on terror, um, yes, I do think it's important for us to still integrate uh, a real analysis on that question as we continue to build the peace movement today, um, because the war on terror, or the war on Islam, to be more precise, is still being used as a pretext for US yeah. military presence and for military aggression all over the world, including the Philippines. I didn't mention it in my presentation, but there, uh, there is an Islamicist uh, armed struggle happening in the South, and the war on terror is being used as a pretext for US-led war in the country. Um, the, just like it was in two, back after 9-11 in 2002. Um, the, on, the, on Nelly's question, which I think is also really important, um, I think if you're an anti-imperialist and one who believes in the self-determination of peoples, it's a really uh, exciting time to be alive. Uh, because the prospects for anti-imperialist unity around the world are excellent. Because first of all, imperialism exists. Because first of all, imperialism exists, and it's in crisis. The mere fact that fascism is rising all over the world is an indication that imperialism itself is in crisis. Yes. We have to pay attention to the international situation. We have to be better at monitoring on global monopoly capitalism and seeing the political economy of war yes. as we rebuild the anti-war and peace movement in the country because as the main aggressor around the world, we have to pay attention to the economic aspect of the war. And the, and the reality is that global monopoly capitalism, there has been no real growth um, in the real economy all over the world for the past 10 years. It's in a chronic state of depression or stagnate or non-growth. Non um, and this is what's fueling uh, desperation for new territory, for new wars of plunder, because the, because the monopoly capitalist powers are running out of resources. And they're, they're stoking war and fascism and militarism all over the world to do so. Um, but what's also in their way is the fact that people all over the world are resisting. The poorest people in the world are resisting the biggest corporations in the world fearlessly, because they know they have nothing to lose. They're doing it not for themselves, but for, for their children, for future generations in their countries. And that type of fearless, fearlessness and resistance is exciting. And I think to build a real anti-imperialist peace movement here, we have to be better internationalists that are in solidarity with these struggles all over the world. Thank you. Any last questions? Yeah. No, more. Let's take, let's take two more. Two more. Two more questions. Say three. Say three. I just wondered the presentation you made on the picture in Africa. Would it be possible for you to put it into writing so we would have an opportunity to absorb it and know what it says? They don't print it here. They don't want us to know. They, want, they don't want us to know what's going on in Africa, what it means, any of that. And you gave a talk that explains it. Could you put it into writing? So say someone like me who has to read it. I can't remember it all, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe I'm too old. 
I don't know, maybe I'm too old, you guys are too young, I don't know. But it sure would help if you could put it into writing so all of us could sit down, oh, that's what's happening. Or, oh, that's what that means. Or, oh, that's what they're doing. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, just quickly, uh, the Black Agenda Report has written on this matter um, extensively. So if you subscribe to the Black Agenda Report, um, certainly you'll get in writing. Uh, also, uh, you have the Black Alliance for Peace. They have their fact sheet in the back. Everybody should make sure they get it before they leave tonight. It's on the table with Julie uh, back there. She can hold them up so you can get it. And um, you've actually echoed something uh, Ajamu has been pushing me, pushing me a lot on. <laughs> Say, I need to write more. So with you seconding that, uh, I definitely need to write more as well. <laughs> wow. So, But there are some sources out there already, and, and I will be writing more as well. Awesome. So these will be the last two questions. Uh, thanks, for uh, everybody, for um, taking the time to explain everything to us. Um, so I wanted to echo that point about what are some of the resources that people can learn about what's happening on the continent of Africa and in uh, Asia, um, Pacific region, who are some good journalists who are doing um, some work that we can follow, um, who are in the community. Um, and my personal question is um, to everyone here, but, also, but especially to the black people um, on the panel, um, is how um, you spoke about people not giving a shit what have been some effective um, kind of ways of communicating with you know regular people, people who are not necessarily um, actu actualizing you know um, in in the same place that we are at right now? How what have been some effective ways that you found to reach out to some normal folks who um, may not understand what's happening or who may not give a shit at the time? or who, um, who uh, you know, just don't know. Okay. Thank you. This will be our last you question of the night. Oh. oh, yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much. This yeah. forum is really great. Um, my, my name is David Rold. I'm with a lot of groups, anti-imperialist groups, and I have um, two short questions. The first one is for um, Ajamu and or Maurice. It's about um, the Boko Haram organization in Nigeria and Cameroon and other countries in Africa. I tend to think that Boko Haram is um, created and supported by the U.S. and the Zionist regime and the Saudis to violently stabilize parts of Africa and even like serve as a pretext for um, U.S. overt military um, intervention like Maurice was talking about in his talk. But other anti-imperialists I work with think that Boko Haram is a legitimate anti-imperialist resistance organization. So I was wondering if you two could, could clarify the character of Boko Haram for us. Mm -hmm. And then my second question is for Ajamu Baraka um, is, are you considering running for president in 2020? Like the, the Green Party needs you to run for, for president. Um, you're like our most inspirational leader in the Green Party. Thank you. Thank you. That has been a question since we were on the trail. So I was actually his campaign manager. Um, so it's come up multiple times. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Flounders with International Action Center and the Solidarity Center here. And I wanted to really thank this panel uh, because there's an enormous amount of cohesion here uh, in thinking, in outlook, in determination, uh, and in optimism mm. at a time when there's no end to U.S. wars and no perspective even for their ending their wars. And we could have had also on this panel from, from Venezuela and from Korea and from Cuba and, you know, anywhere, anywhere in the world and also talking about the migrants and the march that's coming through Mexico and the raids and the roundups here uh, and the LB LGBTQ movement and so many of the movements mm -hmm. that are providing real resistance and energy. So. So these panels, because um, I wanted to 
go back to the point that Ajamu sort of closed with, uh, having a perspective is the best ammunition. And, and panels like this, I think, are enormous contribution of, of folks having both like minds and optimism and determination, which I, I think, um, you know, Berna and Lisa, actually everyone on this panel really addressed. So um, thank you very much, even in going forward. This movement especially needs perspective. That's, that's the real ammunition. Thank you. So if you all can, with your answering the question, give your final remarks, that would be great. Thank you, Shade. Very, very quickly, let me just first start with the question on Boko Haram. Uh, we saw that basically as a consequence of the uh, destruction of the Libyan state, that um, the um, military um, ability or capabilities of a number of groups across the African continent uh, was enhanced uh, because of the proliferation of the arms that came from the state and then were systematically disseminated to various uh, armed opposition groups on the African continent. We believe that that was deliberate. It was part of what uh, Maurice talked about earlier in terms of uh, creating a pretext for more uh, direct U.S. intervention on the African continent. One of the, of the entities that became more um, dangerous was in fact uh, the oppositional group in northern Nigeria known as Boko Haram. Uh, they had some legitimate uh, political concerns uh, within the context of Nigeria, but we know that uh, those kinds of, of concerns and contradictions are used by imperialism for its own particular agenda. Uh, and those concerns were then transformed into an opportunity uh, for the U.S. to uh, become more directly involved uh, in northern Nigeria and in the, the Great Lakes area uh, in general. In terms of the very, very important question about how do we, in fact, engage the public? You know, we have to engage the pub public where the public is right now uh, and recognize that the public is uh, propagandized to its very bones. Therefore, we have to uh, meet people in the churches and in the community groups um, and talk to them about uh, their uh, and our common objective interests. The first thing that, that we say to people is that this issue of war is a, a class issue. That, you know, it is the, 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 the capitalist oligarchy uh, that is uh, bent on sending the sons and daughters of this nation to fight the sons and daughters of working class or poor people around the world. And we say that we have no interest in that. We say that basically uh, our position is not one drop of blood, not one drop of the blood of, of working class and poor people in defense of the capitalist oligarchy. Uh, we talk about the fact that this uh, obscene military budget is a direct theft of the people's resources. And we talk about what those resources could be used for if we really controlled those resources and they were redirected to address the needs of the people in this country. So, you know, we, we, we have to engage in those conversations. It is a long and protracted process, uh, but we have to do it because uh, we had no other choice. Uh, closing remark, <laughs> um, good resources, online resources for information on the Philippines and on the Asia-Pacific region and other, other stuff too. Is, um, one is called Bulatlat, B-U-L-A-T-L-A-T dot com. It's an online newsletter on the Philippines and it has reliable news from the anti-imperialist struggle and very objective news about what's happening in the country. Um, another another good uh, online resource is eboninternational.org. Ebon is spelled I-B-O-N, international spelled out, dot O-R-G. 
This is a good resource for um, updates on the global economic crisis and different struggles around the world, including peasants and, and workers' strikes around the world. Um, another is ILPS.info. It was mentioned earlier that I'm with the leadership of the International League of People's Struggles. And you are all invited to um, the 6th International Assembly of the ILPS, um, June 23 to 26 in Hong Kong. You can contact me for more information. The IAC is a proud member of the ILPS. Um, the ILPS is, as I was stated earlier, is a global formation, anti-imperialist, um, over 300 members in 40 countries, and we need to be better in this country with uh, building anti-imperialist unity, because they're really good at it abroad. Um, they're really good at, at connecting and relating with each other abroad because they need each other. They know that they need each other. They know they have a common enemy. We have to be better here at uniting against a common enemy. Um, and I think seeing that in practice next year is a good you know, way to also learn, you know, um, learn about broad anti-imperialist unity abroad. Um, so the ILPS also just um, is expanding in Africa. There was a country chapter that was established in Senegal last year, and we're hoping to establish our country chapter in Kenya, uh, if not this year, next by next year. So we would love to have our African-American brothers and sisters join us in Hong Kong to get a report on the expansion of ILPS in Africa as well. And lastly, um, just to say that um, the struggle against imperialism is the struggle that's in front of our faces right now. And um, that is a political struggle. It is not an ideological struggle. Let's not have our different ideological backgrounds divide us and disunite us against the common enemy. We have to unite no matter which ideological background you come from, whatever religion you come from, we have a common enemy objectively and we cannot let, the, let us st that stop us from uniting. Thank you. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Uh, because if I don't do this, then Neff is going to get me. Please, uh, if you get a chance to sign the petition that we have for Black Alliance for Peace uh, opposing AFRICOM. Uh, and we, if, you, if you can't sign it here for those folks on the live stream, uh, please, go, please go to blackallianceforpeace.com uh, to sign the petition opposing AFRICOM. To answer uh, the young brother's question about what are the very real things that we can do here, and like some of my uh, colleagues have said, that um, imperialism, this struggle is real. It's not ide ideological. It's about what is going on in our everyday life. What does the world look like when we wake up in the morning to when we go to bed at night? What can we do on those levels? And I think, um, uh, like Brother Jamu said, we have to, uh, we have to talk to people where they're at. And for myself, I mean, nobody can tell me that I'm not changing the world through Facebook. I don't care what nobody says. When I post something, I just think that that's so enlightening. But I think um, that we have to use whatever we have. One of the things that I do like about Facebook is that it gives me the opportunity to go right there with something. Whereas if, when, you know, when you first meet somebody, even at a family cookout, you got to do all this talking and talking and do all this kind of stuff. Before you get to anything about the war, maybe you will or maybe you won't. But on Facebook, you can get right there with it. You can just go from zero to 180 like that. And I like to tag people and my family and all that kind of stuff. And something interesting happened and that one of my um, cousins, and she's very new age, and you know, oh, the, we are all a one and everything, didn't want to hear anything about politics at all, ever. And now she's talking about stopping the war. She's literally put, she goes, you know, we got to look at this war, we got to stop it, we got to ask these kind of questions. And she posted that, and I was like, Okay, but I was glad to see that happening. So we have to just continue to do that. I think we have to rip to shreds that concept of American exceptionalism. I think that's something people can understand. So we have to show it by how racist it is. It's like substituting, uh, you know, oh, well, we're white and we're better than everybody. But they just use the word American exceptionalism. I think it's horrible. We've got to dissect that term and just not allow it to be used. It was used so much in the last presidential election, and it's ugly and it's offensive. You are not superior to anybody on in this world and we need to kill that thought. So I think that that's a very kind of like focused, very simplistic way, something that we can do that everyday people can get. And I also think like when we talk about the budget, I read something just, just you know, incredible to me. But 
21 trillion dollars is unaccounted for at the Pentagon. They did a uh, they did an audit and all that, and they just can't account for that. Now, in terms of what that figure is, because it's so astronomical, we can't even conceptualize it. But I'll give one way of being able to do that: if a person who makes forty thousand dollars a year, it would take them twenty five million years to be able to make one trillion. I think those are concepts people can understand, and we can begin to use them to rip to shreds what's going on. Yeah, 25 million years to make one trillion. I have to do the math on that. Uh, just uh, quickly on some of the sources. Uh, I mentioned before Black Agenda Report is an excellent source. Uh, Pambazuka, P-A-M-B-A-Z-U-K-A, Pambazuka.org is another good source. Our website, Friends of the Congo, Friends of the Congo .org, uh, Go to the homepage and follow our Twitter and Facebook uh, feeds. Uh, we connect struggles um, throughout the continent and, uh, and uh, the African world. That's uh, another good source. Uh, Pacifica Network, uh, WBAI here in, in, um, in New York, WPFW. Uh, in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, across the Pacific Network, you get um, uh, different shows that deal with the, with the, with the continent. Uh, the Real, Real News Network also is, uh, is a good source uh, for analysis on the continent. And um, in terms of connecting, uh, how uh, music, art, uh, theater, uh, those are some of the ways in which uh, we have um, engaged people uh, films, um, I don't know, Solidarity Center, we open a screening films on Africa. Uh, if you follow, sign up for friendsofthecongo.org, we have film screenings um, throughout the city. On December 13th, we'll be screening a film here in the city that looks at uh, U.S. role in supporting uh, authoritarian figures in the Great Lakes region of, uh, of Africa. So if you um, go to our website, uh, friendsofthecongo.org, and sign up. Uh, you'll be able to uh, get uh, alerts uh, when we're having an events in in New York. Uh, so uh, those are those are some uh, um, sources and and ways of uh, of uh, reaching uh, communities. Uh, probably the most powerful that we've found has been really the the films and the music. Uh, we also bring young people from the continent uh, to communities here in the U.S. We do tours uh, and uh, connect with the uh, social movements that are unfolding here. Um, just as, like the, just as there's Black Lives Matter here and other social movements, uh, we have young people in, uh, on the African continent who uh, organized to overthrow uh, Blaise Compare in uh, Burkina Faso. And Blaise Compare was one of the main agents of neocolonialism on the continent, both for France and the United States. So that was a tremendous uh, victory that we all should know about and celebrate uh, those young people. And um, finally, uh, just a, a few quick things. Uh, if what uh, in, in closing, that I think it's vital for us uh, as we look at the continent uh, to look at it uh, as uh, a geostrategic arena, where you have uh, France, Europe, United States, who are um, backing up different agents on the African continent uh, that are fomenting wars. Uh, creating instability. We're often fed the notion that what's unfolding is a lot of ethnic uh, violence, um, but that's uh, not the case. Uh, the kind of violence that unfolds is a, is a result of uh, geostrategic battles, primarily for resources. And the African continent is the richest continent in the world, and it has precious and strategic resources that are vital to the functioning of not only the U.S. and Western militaries, but also our modern day life. You know, in Congo, we have two key minerals, coltan and cobalt. Coltan, your phones wouldn't function the way they do without coltan. Uh, the, your, the mic that I'm speaking on, the laptops. Cobalt, the, for the electric car industry, uh, cobalt is vital. Congo has the largest reserves of cobalt. So these are economic matters that are being uh, fought over on the African continent. However, they're presenting it to you as ethnic conflict and they feed you a pornography of violence. But uh, one thing I would say, look at uh, Congo, Africa, through a prism of justice, not charity. See it as a part of the greater global uh, battle for control of resources around the world. Thank you. Um, just quickly, 
This is an interesting panel. It's different than most anti-war panels that you've seen. This is the kind of anti-war movement that we need, and this is what UNAC is trying to build. We need an anti-war movement that is led by the people who are fighting imperialism at home and abroad. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So if your organization is not a member of UNAC, I urge you to see me and, you, and to join UNAC, because that's um, what we need to do. Um, as one speaker said, you don't hear about the wars. 60% out of every tax dollar is going to the military. You don't hear about the wars in this election, because there are two parties that are pro-war. There's the Republican pro-war party, and the one that's even more pro-war, who doesn't want to talk with Russia, doesn't want to talk with North Korea, that's the Democratic Party. And so the news media is the propaganda arms of those parties. So you have to be the propaganda arm of the anti-war movement. I urge you to join UNAC, to join the movement, and uh, let's struggle um, together. UNAC's website is unacpeace.org. Thank you. And lastly, um, this was live streamed on BAP on the Facebook. So if you want, you can go and share that. And have a great night. Thank you. I'm sorry?